So before we jump into creating a Windows 11 client and perhaps a Windows 10 client, let's talk about the software that I use here. So this is Devolution's Remote Desktop Manager tool and it allows me to have different clients as you can see uh, where I teach, my home network and other clients here so that I can manage virtual machines all in one place. Well, not only virtual machines, but physical machines as well. So for example, here I have some iDRAC connections uh, to servers in the data center, as well as remote desktop connections into the server themselves. So this gives me the opportunity. I don't save passwords in here. They have a wonderful password manager system, but I highly, highly recommend that instead of just using you know, the remote desktop connection each time and having to keep a list of things that you find a client like this. I love this tool. So just, just wanted to make you all aware of it because when you get into the real world, having tools like this make your job easier. So let's talk about creating a virtual machine for the first time. Now, um, my students will be given a network map so they'll be able to see sort of what's going on here. And as we walk through this, I'm going to give you some best practices that have worked for me. Okay. So first and foremost, when we connect a virtual machine, you know, we have to have some virtual switches to connect it to. And as you can see here, um, I have a default virtual switch that is external that's going to go out to the web. And in future videos, we will look at creating a private switch so that only virtual machines can talk to each other, okay? So we basically can create this autonomous network that we can use without affecting production networks, etc. okay? So let's take a look at creating our first virtual machine. The first thing we're going to do is start with new over here and then choose virtual machine. This starts the virtual machine wizard, uh, which is a great way to do virtual machines. We can also walk through this whole process by using and creating a PowerShell script, but we're gonna do it with the graphical user interface this time. So at this point, we're gonna name our virtual machine. You wanna give it a detailed name. If your organization has a naming structure, you're gonna wanna follow that. So you can see that here, I've sort of created a naming structure for CIS 279 WC, which is Windows Client, this means DC, Domain Controller 1, 0001, okay? So here, my students are going to wanna use their first initial last name, okay, uh, for their virtual machine. That helps me identify whose virtual machine is whose, okay? And then I'll do a dash, and I'm gonna have them add these, CIS 279 WC, DSK for desktop 0001. So mine's going to be one, and then I'll assign students to use uh, virtual machine names because, or names that they're going to give those, those systems, because in a future lab, we're going to connect those to this Active Directory domain. Now, store virtual machines. When we talk about storing virtual machines, you can see by default. Microsoft has this path to program data, which can be hidden, Microsoft, Windows, Hyper-V, okay? In our case, we're going to go ahead and browse out, and we're going to go to the root of C. Now, this may be different for future classes. I want to note that, in which case, in the instructions, I've given you a path, okay? This term, as I teach the class, I only have a few students, so we're going to do it a little bit differently. Normally, if I have many students... I'm going to have certain students on one server, the server over here, uh, one, and some students on two, so we can experience what that's like to create networks that traverse over physical machines, okay? So you can see here on the root of C, I have student virtual machines. So this time we're gonna pick that. This is where students are gonna put their virtual machines and we're gonna select that folder. Now we'll see what happens when we create this virtual machine here in a few minutes. So we're gonna create this out on student virtual machines. Again, check your 
instructions. You may be assigned um, through an Excel spreadsheet um, a different path to store your virtual machine. So we'll choose next. Now at this point, we're gonna choose generation two and next. And because we have a lot of memory, we're gonna give these four gigs of RAM. We are gonna go ahead and use dynamic memory. We don't need, even though we have servers with 128 gigs of RAM, we don't need to allocate memory to the server if we're not gonna use it. Now folks, if these are production servers, especially SQL servers, go ahead and give them the RAM, edit the range of RAM they can use, we'll, we'll look at that in a minute, and don't use dynamic, okay? If you have enough memory, a virtual machine is gonna run much better and more efficiently if we give it a dedicated amount of RAM that it can use, and as we know, SQL servers want as much RAM as we can give them. These, these little clients that we're creating, if these were production clients, four gigs, eight gigs if you have, would be recommended, okay? So then we're gonna choose next, and we're gonna connect it to this virtual switch here, okay? This is an external virtual switch, which means my virtual machine is going to have access to the internet, okay? Eventually, we'll also add an additional private switch so that the computer can um, communicate only within a private network, okay? But for now, we wanna do this so that we have the opportunity to apply all the updates as a best practice in creating virtual machines or physical machines. So we'll choose next. Now at this point, I would say reduce this to 60 gig. We'll, we'll never use more than 60 gig on these. This is dynamically expanding, which means it's only going to use as much as we give it. Now, um, if we wanted to, we would statically set these, okay, which makes for better performance. It really, there's a lot of great ways to increase performance of virtual machines that you always want to be aware of. So it just depends on what you're doing with the virtual machine, uh, how much resources it's going to need, etc. So we'll choose next at this point. We are going to install an operating system. This time around, we're going to install the latest operating system, Windows 11. So we're going to browse out, and my students are going to find that on the local drive, C, this is a RAID 5 array. So that's why we're utilizing this. We've got some fast performance. We've got some redundancy. Um, and then, of course, backups will be done on these servers as well. So in this case, we're going to go into student installation files, and we're going to find our Windows 11. This is Consumer Edition, and we're going to click on that, okay? So it's going to use that to install our virtual machine Windows 11 instance. We'll choose Next, and at this point, we're finished, and we'll choose Finished. It'll go ahead and configure that virtual machine. You can see that it's showing up right here. Now, a couple things we need to do with Windows 11 before we can continue on. We're gonna right click here, we're gonna go to settings and we're gonna set some of these settings. So the first one is security. We're gonna go ahead and enable trusted platform, enable that TPM module, okay? That's the first thing we're gonna do. And then for processors, we're gonna come and bring this up to two virtual processors, okay? We've got 24 processors in our machine. Uh, sometimes you'll continue to run these. Sometimes we'll have you shut them off and come back in and turn them on when you need to, okay? So here we are, number of virtual processors. There we go. We've uh, double checked. We are gonna go ahead and turn off at this point checkpoints, okay? We don't need checkpoints turned on. We don't need them utilizing the disk space. Just be very careful with your machine that you don't do anything that blows up your machine to where you have to recreate it, okay? Um, also, make sure to check the instructions because um, I may have you turn these back on or I may have decided to leave them on, but in this case, we're gonna go ahead and turn them off. We know we have access externally to the web. We've got our installation drive showing up here. We should be in good shape. We're going to hit apply and then we're gonna fire up the virtual machine. So at this point, apply, we'll hit okay, and I will double click to start up the virtual machine. 
Now, uh, this is a, these are solid state drives. This is a very fast performing server. So we have to really quickly, as we hit start, uh, hit another key to boot in. So you'll see this, it'll start up, watch very carefully. There it says that, and we gotta hit it. If you miss it, go up, hit the control alt delete key and catch it quickly. Cause if you do, it'll give you an error message and uh, an ethernet looking to boot from the ethernet, which it's not gonna find at this point. So here we are, we're in the Windows installation uh, through the videos and work that you've done already. This should be a no brainer process, but let's go ahead and walk through it. And I will pause the video from this point uh, as it takes its time so that this video and this lecture doesn't get too long. At this point, we're gonna put in our license key I will have given you a license key and made it very clear this license key is to be used only within our labs, okay? This is a lab key and it's to be used only in our labs. So I'm gonna go ahead and put in the key and go past this uh, so that I'm not presenting the key to the public. Now, one quick trick is you put in this key, you've copied the key and just so you know, you can then come up here to clipboard, okay? and type clipboard text and that'll fill in the key so you don't have to type that key. So now we're on the next screen. Once we hit enter for putting into the key, uh, the acceptable use. If you've never read those, you definitely want to read uh, Microsoft's acceptable use policies on say Office, uh, a Windows client and server for sure. So we're going to do a custom install real quick. Here's that drive we configured. So we'll go next and it'll start copying. Now, uh, as it's doing this, let's jump over real quick and see what happened in the folder structure. So we're gonna go to C, okay? We're gonna go to student virtual machines and we're gonna find a folder for my virtual machine. Now, one of the cool things is because we didn't use that default path, all of the content for my virtual machine is gonna be in this folder. So if I go in here, what we're gonna see is virtual hard disks, Okay, here's that virtual hard disk that it's now writing the operating system to. Okay, and then we'll go back and we'll see virtual machines and these are the virtual machine files. So the nice thing about this is everything's in one place. So I do this same thing in production environments. I do this on my personal PC for all of the virtual machines I'm running. It's just an absolutely great way to do that. I'll pause while it continues and completes this installation portion. So as you can see, it completed the install. It's gonna restart. So I'm gonna go ahead and tell it to restart. We'll watch the machine restart and get back to the configurations. Now, as the machine reboots, you're gonna to wanna to be patient here. Um, I'm always quick to click, right? And I know just to be patient, you'll see that it'll go through its process and then we can continue. So here we are, we're gonna walk through this process. now. We're gonna do this uh, uniquely because we don't wanna utilize a Microsoft account. We're gonna utilize local accounts um, and we're gonna eventually configure this machine to connect to Active Directory. We'll go ahead and choose US keyboard. If you're watching this video in another country, of course, uh, choose your appropriate keyboard. We're gonna skip setting up a secondary keyboard. It's gonna check for some pre-install updates. Uh, we, of course, will update the system uh, once we complete it. So for device name, we're gonna use that naming convention that we have, CIS279WCDSK000, oops. Let me pause while I put this in. There we go, so this would be sort of a standard naming convention. We never wanna put a username okay, into a computer name, unless it's part of our business process, right, to delete a computer or to archive a computer when someone leaves. That tends to be expensive. If we're doing virtual machines, not a big deal, right? But if we're talking about physical machines, we're gonna reuse that machine. And in a lot of cases with Active Directory now, we're gonna utilize role-based Active Directory, thus creating roles that people have within the organization. So if someone leaves that role, it's easy to add someone else to that role and not have to recreate a bunch of permissions. So 
always have a good naming convention. This one works really well. You know, here's the name of the quote unquote company, CIS 279 WC. This tells us that this is a desktop. Okay, if you want to know it's virtual, you put in a V, virtual desktop, and then 0001, which allows me 9,999 desktops within my organization. Now, even if I just have networking equipment and have very little networking equipment, I'm still going to use 0001 just to keep it consistent. Okay, great naming conventions are hugely important in an organization. So at that point, we'll give it that and it'll continue. Now, kind of interesting that it restarted there. Not sure if there was an update or something that needed to be done. Normally, we just go through the complete process, then it restarts. Uh, so here we go. We're going to set up for work or school. This way we can do uh, a joining of a domain. Okay. Uh, who's going to use this? So in this case, uh, I'm going to say right now. Now, this is going to just create a local account, right? Oh, I don't want to, sorry, don't want to sign in as Microsoft. I'm going to go to sign in options. There we go. I'm going to say join a domain. And then uh, I'm going to put in my name. Now, this is, again, going to create a local account. So we'll say next. You'll want to give it a password, a secure password that works for you. And then, of course, I'll be having you create an additional user account so that I can get in. Uh, to the local machine as well. So look in the instructions for that. We'll choose next. Uh, we'll confirm that password. Now, great opportunity if you have it to use a password manager. Now, because we're setting this up locally, it's going to ask us for some questions. So you can answer these. Um, as you'll see, I'm going to just give it basic answers because this is a lab. Okay. Uh, so I don't need to worry about this. Now, if you're doing this in a production environment, most likely um, you're doing Active Directory. You won't do this. If you find that you do this, uh, go ahead and have standard answers uh, that the administrators know, okay, so that they can um, get back into the machine, okay? So at that point, it'll go ahead and create that local machine. It'll reboot. We'll have that user account that's going to be our way into the machine. I'm going to just go ahead and accept all this. You, of course, will want to read through this and associate that with whatever your organization's security uh, policies are. Now, as it reboots the final time, it'll go ahead and configure our user account finalize the configuration and bring us up to a login screen. So as you can see, I got right into the machine. I'm just going to finish up this video uh, by initiating, whoops, caps lock, the updates. Uh, so you'll see it goes out to the web, it updates. And finally, I'll just show you that uh, product activation, it has been activated. And again, you know, just, just to remind everyone a second time, be ethical with your licensing. You know, it's the non-ethical that makes a lot of licensing more expensive than it needs to be. So especially my students, be ethical with that code that you're given um, and have fun. Take care.